Hi folks, my name is Emmett Byrne. I'm producer on Warhammer Age of Sigmar Soulbound for Cubicle 7. Uh, today I'd just like to do a bit of a, an introduction to the rules for Soulbound. So uh, kind of pretty much the, the core mechanics of the game and, and, and what you will do, be doing when you're playing. Um, so Soulbound uses D6 dice pools um, and a, a kind of a basic, you build your dice pool from attribute plus a skill. Um, if you look at our character creation video, we kind of go into a bit more about attributes and skills and things. But the basic your attributes are body, mind, and soul. Your body um, is kind of your strength and speed and things like that. Uh, mind is your mental acuity and, and um, your problem-solving ability. Soul is your kind of your essence and your presence and, and, and kind of I suppose willpower and charisma and all that kind of stuff rolled into one. And then you have a series of skills, you know, like athletics and reflexes and um, guile, which is kind of like charm, um, and your weapon skill and ballistic skill, all that kind of stuff. So you build your dice pool from the your attribute plus skill. Um, if you have um, training in a skill, uh, then you, you build your dice pool from that. So you can have training or focus in a skill. If you have training, it gives you extra dice. If you have focus, you can adjust the dice um, after the roll. But again, we talk a bit more about that in the um, character creation video. Um, so the core soulbound is tests, which um, you know, any any time you come up against something where the outcome is uncertain, the GM will probably ask you to make a test. So um, a test is the GM will set the the difficulty, the DN, um, so the difficulty number of the test, and you'll have to try and um, equal or exceed it. So tests are, we have a couple of different types of tests. So kind of common tests, which are the tests you'll make um, kind of regularly throughout the game, um, which are you're just rolling off against a difficulty number and trying to uh, equal or exceed it. You have opposed tests when you're directly working in opposition with someone, um, so like a chase or trying to hide. And then you have extended tests, which are tests over um, a longer period of time. So like, uh, like crafting, if you're spending a couple of weeks crafting, you might make an extended test or, you know, even if it's over the course of a minute, if you're trying to, uh, you know, hold up a, a crumbling wall while your, your, your party escapes, that might do an, the GM might call for an extended test there potentially. Um, but usually it's, it's m much more long term, um, like crafting or, or, or uh, maybe trying to find knowledge in a city over the course of a, a, a week or so or a couple of hours. So the um, tests are built from two different factors. So you have your difficulty and complexity. Um, difficulty is the number you're trying to meet. So if the difficulty is four and you roll your dice, any four and up, so four, five, and six counts as a success. So that's the difficulty of the test. The basic difficulty is four, um, which if you're rolling one D6, that you have a 50% chance to succeed. Um, and then for higher higher um, difficulty tests, uh, the, the number goes up. As you can see here uh, on our difficulty numbers explained, so four is average, so climbing a rocky mountain uh, or rocky outcropping. So if you start from the bottom, DN21. So this is how our tests are presented. I'll just zoom in a bit so you can see. Um, so two, one. So the first number there is your difficulty. The second number there is a complexity, which we'll get into now in a second. So the complexity is the number of successes you need. The difficulty is the number you need to equal or exceed. So in this case, difficulty two, needing one success, very easy. So climbing up onto a wall. Um, and then difficulty three, slightly more difficult, climbing a tree, uh, which would be easy. And then your average difficulty, climbing um, a rocky outcropping, the, the key word there being rocky because it has kind of handholds and stuff. Uh, and then five, um, difficulty five, will be climbing a rocky outcropping during a storm. And difficulty six will be very hard, so climbing a, a sheer cliff uh, made of smooth glass. Um, so your difficulty is the first number, so it's the first number here, so two, three, four, five, six are your, your difficulty. Um, it'll always be from two to six. Um, so six and uh, sixes will always succeed, and uh, ones will always fail. Um, so that that's kind of that that's the basics of the difficulty of a test. So uh, there are, are, are regular tests in the game. Um, most tests that you're doing will be difficulty four one five one six one that kind of thing. You'll only need a success, and then if you succeed, that's it. So you know if you're trying to jump over a gap in the, from one building to another, you succeed, and that that's it. You just need one success. You do it, fine. Um, then you move on to complexity. Um, 
which is disappearing me there, complexity. Um, so complexity is if the task is a little more difficult or a little more involved than normal, you might need extra successes. So normally, you know, jumping over um, from building to building, you need one success. Um, if the task was a bit more involved, like say, trying to disarm a bomb or, or um, like I'm saying, trying to hold up a, a crumbling archway or something so your, so your party can escape or hold a door closed or something. Um, you could increase, the GM could increase the difficulty or the complexity of it, apologies. Um, so what would happen there is you'd have say, you still determine the difficulty. So the task can be difficult and complex. So you would have, okay, well it's an average difficulty task, but it's, it's a little more involved. So average difficulty is four um, and it takes a, a little, um, it's a little more complex. So it, you need two successes to do it. So the, the DN would be four, two. So if you look at our numbers here, if you display this four one, it would actually be four two. So that means you need to roll at least two fours. So if you have a dice pool, um, six, whatever you roll, roll your dice. If two or more fours show up, you succeed. If you don't get it, if you only get one four, then you failed, unless you have a way to adjust the dice, like we were mentioning in focus. Um, and uh, so then, but then you could have a situation where, you know, holding up that crumbling wall I was talking about is not a difficult task per se, but it, it, it you can use complexity to uh, reflect the time it takes to do that. So the difficulty of the task is say three to hold it up um, for our, our, our night quester stormcast. Um, but it takes, say, three rounds. So you could say it's difficulty three, complexity three. So DN three, three. So it should be relatively easy, but it's going to take a bit more time. So the, the character in question would have to roll um, three threes on their dice pool. Um, so that's kind of our, that's the basics of tests are difficulty and complexity. And those numbers change and go up and down over the course of player as, as the GM dictates for various tests. Okay, um, so as I said, our, our, our standard test is called a common test. It's just, it's the test you'll be making most often. It's um, jumping over a gap, it's trying to lift something heavy, um, it might be trying to look for information, look for a clue in a scene, trying to spot someone, um, or trying to stay quiet, some, something like that. So that, that's, that's your standard common test. Um, then you have a pose test, which is when you're working in direct opposition with someone. So in that case, you are both rolling against each other. And the way that that works is the GM will set the, the DN of the test uh, or the, the, the difficulty of the test. The standard would be DN 4-1. So both parties have to get fours. Whoever gets the most fours or higher wins. So if, you know, uh, say we had a, a witch elf trying to hide from a rat ogre. The witch elf, uh, they're, they're using different skills, but they are in opposition to one another. Okay, so if we say it's DN4-1, if the witch elf rolls 46 and gets two fours um, and nothing else, say everything else is a failure, they have two successes. If the rat ogre rolls their perception, say it's 3d6 and they get uh, three fours, they've succeeded. So they, they've beaten, um, they've beaten the uh, the witch elf in that case and they would spot them. Um, so it's whoever has the highest wins. Um, generally, it, if uh, in the case of ties, you would usually, it's, it's up to the GM, but generally it's the the, um, the instigating party or, or, or the kind of the, the aggressor um, wins, basically. Um, so, that's your opposed test. So, so when you're rolling up against, against someone else or another character um, or another even another player, you use opposed tests. Um, the GM again can change the difficulty based on uh, what you're trying to accomplish, but usually it's DN four one, and then um, and you just see who gets the most, and, and that's it. So essentially, the other player is setting the complexity of the the test. So you're trying to meet or exceed whatever uh, whatever they roll um, then you have uh, what we call advantage and disadvantage so in a post test some party might be uh, in a more advantageous position some might be disadvantaged say in the case of the witch elf and the rat ogre if the um, 
if the, the witch elf was trying to hide in a shadowy city, she would have advantage on the test. Um, so what advantage does is it lowers the difficulty for that party. So the witch elf would only have to roll three and up. So it's three one for the witch elf. Um, and any threes they get, they succeed. Um, if they were trying to hide in broad, broad daylight, they would be at disadvantage. So it would be DN 5-1. So it would go up one step. So um, so then it's, it's obviously harder to hide in, in broad daylight than in, in shadow. A lot of the time you'll have a situation where um, if one side has advantage, the other side will often have disadvantage. So again, if you're hiding in a shadowy city, the, um, the witch elf would have advantage on that test. The rat ogre might have disadvantage um, because they can't see as well at night, say. Um, again, you know, if, if it was in broad daylight, the, the witch elf has disadvantage to hide and someone searching for them might have advantage on the test. So you would have that situation where the, the witch elf will be rolling need fives and ups and the person looking for them, say the rat ogre, would need three and up. So it's much easier for the person with advantage um, to succeed in that in that case. Um, so that's how advantage and disadvantage work. In rare instances, you might have greater what we call greater advantage and greater disadvantage when things are really bad or really good in your favor, and the difficulty will go up too. So if you have greater advantage, um, or, or go down to it would go down to two. You'd only need twos and up to succeed. If you had greater disadvantage, you would only succeed on sixes. So you need six and up to succeed. Um, and that's how our, our opposed tests work. Um, obviously, in, in, in the, the core book, we go into more detail on it. We have some clearer explanations, and, and, and you can get an idea of it um, uh, to to uh, get a full understanding of, of the rules. Um, one other thing within um, the opposed tests is we have something called natural awareness, which is, you mark on your character sheet. It's just your natural perception of the world around you. If someone's trying to sneak past you or you're trying to notice something in the environment, um, your natural awareness might let you notice it without making a test. Natural awareness is um, it's kind of calculated at the end of uh, um, character creation, and we go into that a bit there as well. And then the, the last test that we have are called extended tests, um, which take uh, more time. So an extended test would be something like, okay, if you're trying to uh, repair your armor or build a new piece of armor um, or a new piece of equipment or something like that, you would make an extended test. We have a number of extended test examples um, as our like, downtime activities. So you'll have a lot of the car drawn. If they want to make new equipment, they have to make an extended test to create the equipment. If um, a fire slayer wants to make a new rune or, or install a rune, they have to, they have to make it an extended test. So the way an extended test is works the, pretty much the exact same, um, but it'll have much higher complexity. So it might be DN410. So you actually need 10 successes to do it, but you'll have multiple attempts to do it. And it's up to the GM. So the GM will kind of determine how long it takes, um, the number of successes required. Um, so that would be the complexity of the test and how many tests you get to make. So if it's a, say a DN4 16, so you need 16 successes, um, and the GM says you only have four chances to make it, maybe it happens over the course of four days. Um, you That would be essentially a DN, uh, you would need four successes each time, which would be very difficult. So you would need, it was essentially a DN4 4 test, which is quite difficult to do. Um, if the same test over with eight attempts is much easier because uh, you only need at least two successes. So if it was DN4, 16, and I had eight attempts to make it, I just need two or more successes um, on a couple of tests and it should pass. So the GM can change the difficulty on it depending on time constraints or the actual um, complexity of the test as well. So as I said, if you look at our um, Between Adventures chapter, we have a couple of examples um, on extended tests. So you have either crafting and engineering, which um, has an extended test as well. So you get to make you make three mind crafting tests um, to try and succeed. And the difficulty of it is determined by the piece of equipment you're trying to make, which is listed in the equipment chapter. So that's um, how extended tests work. Um, last thing we have on test is uh, degrees of success. So depending on how well you succeed on a test, the GM might give you a little benefit. Um, so if you meet the DN, whatever it is, if, if you only need one success and you want to get one success, then you succeed. 
nothing more, nothing less. If you get one or more um, successes than you needed, the gem might give you a, a minor benefit. You, you might find like a secret, uh, if you're kind of scouting out a, a chaos um, fort, you might find a secret entrance or a, se a secret way in. Um, and then a major benefit, you get a major benefit if you say you get three or more successes on a test. So in that case, it might be, oh, you've, you've spotted a weakness in the, the actual um, chaos warriors themselves and you, um, you get a bonus for say um, the full, a uh, full day um when you're encountering them so so it might be something like you spotted a weakness in them so um their defense is considered one lower for any attack you make against them for the next 24 hours or something like that if you get a a, a major benefit like that it should be feel tangible you, you've done really well on the test now some some um tests you might not get a minor or major benefit they just might not be something pertinent to that situation but a lot of the time it, it, it's nice it, it, it helps to feel like you've really accomplished something if you get a lot of successes and you get a little benefit for it and that's the that's the idea here um okay so that's an overview of tests and and, and how tests work in Soulbound. just a broad overview to give you an idea of how the the rules um interplay and, and kind of most of what you'll be doing in uh, when you play Soulbound. Um, just a, a couple of things I'll go over really quickly just right at the end. Um, so as well as that, the uh, tests, one of the other key features of Soulbound is metal. Metal is like uh, this resource, kind of your inner, your inner strength almost um, that you have in the game that lets you do, um, lets you push beyond the boundaries of normal people. So what metal does is metal actually lets you say in combat, it lets you take an extra action Metal only really comes into play in combat. It's kind of that, that, that um, adrenaline almost. Um, so metal will let you take an extra action in combat. Um, metal fuels a number of talents and miracles. Um, so important for um, blessed characters. Metal can also, you can choose to spend metal before you make a test. So if you're in combat, um, so if you're making an attack, you can choose to spend metal and that will double your dice for training. So if you had uh, 2d6 extra dice for training and you spend metal, that would actually be 4d6 which is really useful for, say, getting through someone who has uh, an enemy that has a lot of armor or something like that, um, or for a particularly difficult spell. Um, you can also spend metal after you roll to double your focus. So again, if you had plus two focus, that would allow, uh, that would become plus four, which would allow you to spend four points among your dice pool. So you could give plus one to four different dice, plus two to two dice, plus three to one dice, plus one to one dice, and then yeah, and so on. Um, so metal lets, lets you do that and you get recover one metal every turn and um, characters with high soul which we mentioned have uh more metal um which makes them kind of quite powerful um at the start of combat or or, or for uh blasted characters who uh cast miracles using metal okay um so that's metal um again it's explained in detail here on page 130 um so take an extra action use the talent or miracle, double your training, double your focus. So that's what um, that's uh, another component of, of, of Soulbound. Um, we have a little box here on using metal outside of combat, which you generally don't do. It's more so an in combat thing. And then lastly, I'll just really quick go over um, one of the one of the the things about Soulbound that kind of sets it apart a little bit. So. Um, what you have is we have soul fire and doom um, soul fire is something that the binding gets um, so if you go and watch our video on binding it's it, it, it's this group of people that pun, come together and their souls are literally bound so they are soul bound um, soul fire is a shared resource between the soul bound that they can draw on to do um, incredible things so if you are you can use soul fire. You the, the party has a number of soul fire equal to the number of people in the binding, um, which so if you have five people in the binding, you have five soul fire uh, amongst everyone. Um, it doesn't include stormcast eternals. Stormcast eternals can't be soul bound um, because they're already bound to sigma. But uh, again, we talked about that in the soul bound video. Um, so soul fire is a really powerful resource, and it takes a while to come back. So you have to kind of use it sparingly. So what you can do with soul fire is, oops. You can maximize your successes. So if you spend soul fire, you any dice you roll for that test would be considered a six. So if you're rolling sixty six, you essentially get six sixes. Um, 
So it, now you can't use metal and soul fire, so you couldn't double your training and then spend metal. Um, but if the GM says you can, then that's up to the GM. But um, per the rules, you, you can't. But you can maximize your success, successes. So that would be you maximize any dice you get from your attributes and any dice you get from um, training. Uh, and then you spend soul fire and you get, um, they are all max successes. So that's really good for, um, really powerful spells or uh, pretty much anything really so if you're attacking a really strong enemy and you just want to max out your dice then you can just go and spend soul fire and you can do that um you can use soul fire to re-roll dice so if you have uh, rolled a test and failed you can re-roll any of the dice that failed um not quite as powerful as doing it uh, maximizing stats from the start but it gives you a little more freedom to try something and go oh, okay well i'm going to spend soul fire and try and do it um, and you can re-roll dice if you spent metal to double your training you could then spend soul fire to re-roll dice and you're rolling with more dice again um, you can spend soul fire to regain metal so if you spend soul fire you regain all your metal up to your maximum um, which again will give you more actions so if you have three met uh, three metal you spend a soul fire and then straight away you have three more actions you can take straight uh, or spend on miracles or, or whatever you want to do with it um, you can recover toughness. So if you spend soul fire, you pretty much your toughness comes all the way back up. Um, we talk about toughness and wounds in the character creation um, video as well, and we'll talk about it in uh, the combat video. But um, so you can spend soul fire to recover your toughness, go up to your maximum toughness again. And then lastly, you can spend soul fire to cheat death. So you can either yourself or a member of the binding. If you spend soul fire the target is no longer mortally wounded so if if they're about to die and they're mortally wounded you can spend soul fire or you know you can spend soul fire to save someone or you can spend soul fire to save yourself um if you were the one dying so you are no longer mortally wounded and recover half your toughness and you keep your wounds but you are no longer mortally wounded um and you're no longer dying which is very important um soul fire is tracked on the party sheet which kind of tracks important information um, and there's various different ways of getting soul fire back, but um, I'll leave that. To, you, can, you can read up on that yourself. Um, and then, if the party does great deeds, you can increase actually increase the maximum soul fire beyond the amount of um, characters in the binding, which is really good. And then the last thing I want to talk about is Doom, which is um, it, 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 it's not another resource; it's more of um, it colors the world or is a representation of the world. At, uh, as it is now so doom represents all the bad things in the world it's chaos and death and destruction um and how bad things feel so doom always starts at one or sorry doom doesn't always start doom cannot go below one so there's always this creeping dread somewhere in the world um and doom represents that um if things get worse if the party fail if they choose to ignore something and the um, things get a little bit darker doom goes up and um, the higher doom goes the more you'll see acts of like open aggression and violence in the in the world and um, it changes how the world actually feels and it, it this is the way for chaos to make its way into the world again this is what happened in the age of chaos there's um, little cracks in the world and people turning on one another um, and, and the world is becoming a worse place so as Doom creeps up, the world gets worse. Um, it, the GM can use this to color their descriptions of the world and how the world feels, how people react to you. Um, but also it, it has a mechanical, it can have a mechanical effect as well, where you'll have some creatures who have armor, say, equal to one plus Doom. So the higher the Doom is, the harder they are to hurt. You have um, other, other creatures that might have uh, deal damage equal to plus Doom. So they'll have their standard damage and they'll leave more damage equal to Doom on top of it. So they're always getting at least plus one. And if Doom goes up and up and up, they become terrifying. So you have these real mechanical effects of Doom going up. So the party wants Doom to stay down. They can it can never go below one. But by making changes in the world, making positive change and, and helping people and trying to protect the cities of Sigmar, um, Doom can be managed and, and, and stay at a manageable level. It'll never go away, but it stops the world from getting worse. And um, it, it, it helps 
you as players or, or, or the GM to feel like they're really making a difference. Doom is a great way for GMs to express how the world is and, and, and it's on the party sheet. Um, players can see it all the time, how high Doom is going to go and, and it's just this kind of dread creeping into the side. But again, if, if you do something good and you wipe out that chaos uh, dread hole that we talked about, um, Doom will go down. You, you've made a positive change on the world. You, you've done something good. People around you see this they're kind of filled with hope and, and hope kind of counteracts doom um so doom is another really cool mechanic and uh, element that we have in soulbound um so we have the effects of doom and increasing doom and tracking doom and stuff there as well there's gm advice in the gm chapter on doom and using our rumor fear threat um format which we'll talk about in a later video um for using doom in in that way but but that's uh that's doom so so that's the basics of Test and Soulbound and Metal and Soulfire and Doom. Um, I just wanted to give a, a brief overview of the, the kind of basic rules of Soulbound and, and some of the cool things that you'll uh, be playing around with if, you, if you're playing Soulbound. Um, we won't get into combat. We'll do another video on combat because combat is going to be a video all to itself. Um, but for now, that's 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 the uh, the introduction to the basic rules for um soulbound for warhammer age of sigmar soulbound um the if you want to keep an eye on more of our stuff um if you go to cubicle7games.com you'll see all the latest news on soulbound on warhammer fantasy on wrath and glory doctor who all our all of our other games um and we have our we have our store here obviously we have advice on how to play how to how to gm as well um and then our news, which is updated fairly regularly. Um, if you're watching this uh, in August, we've just released uh, our latest adventure for Soulbound, which is there. And then we've lots of fun stuff for uh, Warmer Fantasy and Wrath and Glory as well. So um, you can follow us there on cubicle7games.com. Um, you can follow us on Facebook and Twitter. And you'll get um, kind of regular updates on, on, on what's happening with, uh, with us. And when we release new news and new products and... Um, and release new videos as well um okay so that that's it for me folks so uh thanks for watching if you have any questions uh let us know you can drop them in the comments or just send us a message on twitter or facebook or um or wherever you can track us down that's great thanks folks bye